Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Erlock, and this is another talk on modern European philosophy, specifically Immanuel Kant, rationalism, idealism, and pretty much the future of still modern European, plenty, still, philosophy. Because as I have been mentioning, it is Kant who is the last major philosopher shared by both the analytic Anglophonic school of America, uh, American and British thought, and the continental Germans and French who go Hegel onward. Uh, so modern European thought very much starts all over the place, as we've had in France and Britain and Amsterdam even. And then we have, with Kant and Hegel, two major heavy-hitting Germans, along with we already had Leibniz. And from then on out, we have the analytics still today dominating American universities and British universities in the Anglophonic world are very analytic and neo-Kantian. And the Germans leading to the French and what is called very broadly and misunderstood often postmodernism is very Hegel and onward. So Kant and Hegel are two very important thinkers for understanding modern thought. And even if you don't like philosophy, they're in a lot of art and a lot of culture. And they are signposts of the times telling us what's going on as far as understanding subjectivity and objectivity. So getting into Kant carefully and a bit of the critique, oh, old pure reason, is very important. So today we're going to have here Kant and his fantastic untrained cats, uh, which are categorical and hopefully moral ever still. Because Kant very much believes we have categories in the mind. We are a blank slate, but a blank, a blank slate, like Locke has already said, the Brit and the empiricist, but wrestling with Hume, awoken from his dogmatic slumbers, and wrestling with Berkeley, the idealist we had last time, Kant does believe that Berkeley and Hume are right, that empiricists are correct, and these Brits, as a German, he thinks, that we are getting our minds and our realities through our experience. However, Kant also believes that the blank slate we are has certain cabinet slots, drawers, cubby holes, what are often referred to I don't believe still that it's Kant, but I believe it's often referred much like uh, Descartes says, a man of industry, and then often it is the brain in the vat or now the matrix. But Descartes did not say brain in a vat or matrix, of course, but it is often the brain in the vat and the matrix for Descartes. For Kant, it is often something like glasses. I was just looking into one of my favorite comedians is Robin Harris, an unsung black American comedian from the 90s. Uh, who unfortunately uh, went out right at his, uh, when it was starting to be his time. And uh, Spike Lee very much helped his career. I was looking into his life and he says, because he's very much an insult and, hey, we're all human with the snaps, very com uh, comedian. He sees Spike Lee in the audience and he says, is that Mr. Magoo over there? You know, what do you think? That with Kant, we have, a la Spike Lee, very large, frames of glasses. We use our minds to frame the situation. And Kant believes we have a very still set frame, very much like Spike Lee's iconic large 90s, uh, very much glasses. And so in that sense, like some of Spike Lee's movies, actually, and I was thinking about the French film Hate, which you, uh, if you haven't seen is a 90s, I believe, film that's somewhat like Spike Lee, but set in France with a, uh, a Jewish kid, a Arabic kid, and a black kid in France uh, wandering around and getting into it with white supremacists and things back and forth in the 90s. It's an interesting film. I liked it in college back in the day. Just like large glasses in some of Spike Lee's films in the movie Hate, uh, much in life is black and white. Now, why is that? In fact, we had with Hume, well, if things are all sand piles and if we're just a pile of a bunch of experience Buddhistically, why does 2 plus 3 cleanly equal 5 all the time? And I have explained it in these ways and, uh, and various wheelings and dealings and wordings over my years of teaching. And essentially what Kant is arguing is that it'd be great if we all just pile up as a bunch of sand like Hume says, but isn't it weird that we have adverbs and, and the Chinese, I'll paraphrase today for you, uh, it is not Kant. Uh, again, Wittgenstein even himself says, I'm not sure if Chinese people would always smile when they're happy, and that's just simply because I clearly don't know, he says, Chinese people are Chinese culture. Thankfully, here in California, I do, and I can assure Wittgenstein, again, after his passing, that yes, Chinese people pretty much smile and withhold smiles very much like human cultures, you know what I mean? Which you really wouldn't have an abacus for, or a kind of algebra, you know, or something else uh, later golden aged. Uh, basically, of course, you would be looking at people, living with people, kind of having vague understandings, but... 
For Khan and for Wittgenstein, often a smile is a smile or not, of course. So how is it that we have all these sand piles, and yet somehow we have all this experience? It is so wishy-washy and strange. It's not the destiny, it's the journey, man. But in spite of the journey, man and woman and everyone, we end up having very categorical worlds such that math is danged true. We already had with Locke, objective truth is something like four sides to a square as opposed to a subjective shade of red. So why is it that we have objective truth in our lives if we're also aware that everything is culture and conditioning and sand piles? After Hume, you have Kant awoken from his dogmatic slumbers. And I like Hume a lot, but there is a very powerful argument to be made against Hume. Even though I like Hume, and even though I react very against Kant in, an, in a latter Wittgensteinian way, and that's what I was trained a bit in, at Berkeley to be, is not just neo-Kantian, but against it with a later Wittgenstein edge, which is sort of what is interesting and hip still in American philosophy and has been for a while for me and for many others. Overall, it could be described that basically Kant says, but wait a minute, our blank slate for Locke, our sand piles for Hume seem to come in clean edged things sometimes like two plus three equals five and Christian morality, which means that Kant is not far from the Cartesian tree. Is he? Again, he's German. Uh, close enough to France, you know, possibly, as Lewis Carroll might sing or have an imaginary character sing to us. We have 2 plus 3 equals 5. We have, ad we have adverbs. Noam Chomsky says X bar Y bar theory. Why is it that we can understand other cultures and understand sci-fi stories about creatures that do and don't have 2 plus 3 equals 5 and demons convincing us 2 plus 3 equals 6 or something? How can I say any of this nonsense to you if we have categorical minds such that 2 plus 3 equals 5? This actually is the back and forth of Hume to Kant to onward that we're going to be getting into in the simplest of terms. If Hume is right, and if truth is assumption, habit, and subjective prejudice, which is very, very true, such that I can say to you, math is very much human practices, why is it also that math very much isn't just human practices and is very objective and rational and deductive? That is a very good set of onward issues. And that's the simplest way of phrasing why Hume to Kant to onward is eventually going to end up with my kind of bent, which is somewhat here after Wittgenstein, which we will get to sequentially one and another. But basically, if all of this is experience, how do we have the glasses? How do we have categorical black and white truth if, if everything is sand piles, shades of gray in experience? And Kant is aware of that problem. He does not actually say there's black and white truth directly in experience per se. We wouldn't get it there. We would get it because we can see through experience how our minds are deductive and categorical. Now, there's a lot in that that I completely support. He then comes to the conclusion that it thought has to be categorical these ways and is objective and true when it is. I think that you can actually use Wittgenstein in a lot of German and French thought afterwards, which is very continental, to show how actually our objective frames of math and or science and or religion, which is very Kant and Descartes both, how it may not be as pure and arithmetic, you know, uh, pure arithmetic and arithmetic as much as this would seem. But very much Kant is we have black and white glasses we view the world through, right? Many people think that, well, no matter what you believe, because of some jerk out there. So why? Why, if everything is infinite shades of gray in many parts of the elephant, do we have black and white glasses and how does that work? That is very much, in a sense, a lot of philosophy in a nutshell, and that is very Hume to Kant to onward. So let's go Kant and then onward in the class. Immanuel Kant was born in 1724 and he died in 1804. He was a German philosopher who was technically born in what was once Königsberg, Prussia, today part of Russia, and renamed Kalingrad. While Kant grew up in a devotedly pietist family, a branch of Lutheranism that placed a great emphasis on individual morality and purity, he found himself drawn to rationalism and in opposition to religious ceremony. While a professor, at least it seems, he wasn't very loud and proud about that, but as a, while a professor at the University of Konigsberg, Kant was always indisposed whenever it was his turn to participate in church services. What all this suggests, as many have, Kant very much believed in God and believed in purity. He thought that was more science and math, and he found religion to somewhat, and we could say he was a deist, very much like the Founding Fathers right around. He is from 1724 to 1804, which means he's right around an el a bit of an elder, middle-aged, elder age, right as 
the founding fathers of America say are participating in the American Revolution. So he very is de he very much is deist. He's not so into traditional religion, but he very much thinks that this is somewhat somehow the mind and purity of God down here in our lives. So he doesn't like church services so well, but he is going to argue for categorical morality and believes that is very, uh, and quite exclusively, Christian and true. So it is said that Kant never traveled more than 50 kilometers from his hometown in his entire life. He was known for being obsessively punctual. He is quite a type A. And of course, if you wanted an example of a categorical thinker who's a little bit type A, well, you couldn't do worse a bit than make fun of Kant for being a categorical human being. He is also, and in the years after teaching about him, it's very easy to present his life as if he is type A uptight. Uh, type A is in a psychology old way, I'm not even sure how current it is, of being like uptight and rigid and uh, not just neurotic, but puritanical. And then type B is, eh, you know, whatever, which isn't good or bad. It is more, do you have like stick within the, the lines or color outside of the lines, man, whether or not that's good or bad in a personality, of course, or in situations. So Kant is a very rigid, you know, uptight person, type A, as it was referred to, which of course, if you're doing logic, it's like A versus not A. Yes, exclusively, you know, separate the two. So Kant, never traveled more than 50 kilometers from his hometown. He was known for being obsessive and punctual, and legend has it that he was very fun at parties and he was a good friend to people, so you don't want to present him just like he is just one thing. That he would take his daily walks after lunch, it was said, at least the legend grew so routinely, perhaps afterwards, that housewives would set their clocks, their grandfather clocks, their glockenspiels, yes, as Kant passes by their Germanic housing. So Kant would always walk alone, uh, as he believed it proper and healthy to breathe through one's nose in the open air and so kept his mouth closed outside. He would have a blast during this plague. By the way, again, as we're going to get to, as I always like, he thinks the use of electricity causes uh, electric cat plagues. It's too, uh, we've, I've been indoors too long. I can't help but make a lot of jokes. Of course, I have in the past, and this year, it's something yeesh. So, Kant likes to keep his mouth closed outside. He thinks it could cause you health problems if you don't. He also was deeply disturbed by perspiration. Um, it is said, so again, he really is kind of a bit puritanical and into, well, something like, uh, yeah, I'm thinking the whole Kellogg's routine kind of thing. It is said that the only morning Kant broke from his strict uh, routine, which is a hilarious story if it's true because it's going to set up Hegel for next time here, was to purchase a newspaper announcing the outbreak of the French Revolution, which the American Revolution was important. Um, the French Revolution coming very nearby it was kind of important for all of Germany and France and everybody and Napoleon, you know, eventually and everything, right? You know, so the outbreak of the French Revolution was huge, you know, for all of European history uh, subsequently. So Kant actually broke his routine and his daily walk. Perhaps there was a grandfather clock a bit off or two. That, uh, in which case you tune the offspring is that Kant supposedly broke his routine for the French Revolution in the newspapers, getting the papers, and it had a great impact also, the French Revolution and Kant both, on Hegel. Because Hegel is very much trying to do Kant and surpass him, and Hegel is a boy watching the French Revolution. What you can see here is Kant is actually a more conservative, uptight guy watching the French Revolution, thinking, ah, sort of, but no. And Hegel's like, yay, and then later, but also no, and he gets much more conservative and into German Lutheranism already being the final form of culture in his older years. But in his younger years, boy Hegel was like, yee, the French Revolutions, uh remaking the state and culture a whole lot. So Hegel is young watching what disturbs Kant from his walks, <laughs> which, again, is quite dialectical. We'll get into, uh, yes, as we go and proceed onward step by step and stage by stage. Next time. So just as Locke is famous for his work on in both epistemology, which is how we know what we know and what's objective versus subjective, and political theory... Kant is famous for his work in epistemology uh, and ethics. Now, just like with Locke, it's appropriate to say, hey, there's two or three things you may want to know about Kant and ethics. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on Kant and ethics. I actually do spend a lot of time on Kant and ethics for the ethics class, as you uh, would hope. 
But, and I used to frame the ethics class with Mill versus Kant, I now leave that towards a latter uh, modern European period and try to keep that also chronological. Because I used to frame things in terms of modern European stuff, and honestly, I've kept my other classes pretty much, you know, chronological as much as one can and one can't entirely. And so, yes, jumping all over the place, as we do. How does that keep happening? I blame everyone else. You know, they're all all over the place, really. Not me. I keep put. As we jump all over the place, and I do, with my talking and fancy wording, we're going to talk a tiny bit about Kant's morality here, and I'm just going to say a thing or two in passing. You want more of that? Take the ethics class, you know, watch the ethics stuff, and of course I have more on that. Uh, forever is here. So, Kant believed in strict rule-abiding morality, which he considered the true means of Christian salvation, not religious ritual, which of course means he believes in something almost like, again, the Mutazilites of Islam were the hard rationalists. They were most like what we would call deists, or like Kant and rationalists here, in Europe, I mean, and in fact, this is more analytic neo-Kantian times, so we don't really call people strictly rationalists now who are very rationalists and Kantian and neo-Kantian. We would call them more neo-Kantians now. The Mutazilites are very early uh, rationalists, uh, proto-rationalists in Islam, Th thus they are proto-neo-Kantian, proto-proto-neo-neo -neo somebody or others out of the matrix, yes? but still in it, as it were. Because God can't contradict God's self. The things have to work non-contradictory wise. Things have to be rational and algebraic. That's the mind, oh God, and that's reason. So again, Kant is very much in line with, no, you need black and white morality, that's God, except he also doesn't really think that needs to be going to church. He thinks, no, that's math, and thus, in certain ways, the math of the mind. Although it gets iffy because ethics is, secondary, is technically, as much as Kant is very famous for it, that's actually involving the passions and concerns a bit in secondary as opposed to pure, pure math for Kant. But he very much believes the ethics that's any ethics at all is pure, pure rule math-like, thus. Really, it is always abiding by the rules rather than letting your concerns get into ethics, which is ethics for Kant, which isn't, isn't ethics for everybody. In fact, very opposed to that is Mill, but we're not there yet. And in fact, that's for the ethics class more so. Using our universal faculty of reason, which Kant believes we have universal math mind, therefore 2 plus 3 always equals 5, Kant argued that we can come to understand absolute principles, morals to which we should always adhere no matter the consequences. That means even if all the school buses go off the off the trail with and the road with all the children, unfortunately, you always should stick to the rules, and that is exactly where the consequentialist and utilitarian gets their foot in the door in all of us. Kant argues in the rear here, you know, Kant argues that if we are rational, we are concerned with absolutes that are universal and ideal. If we are rational. Apparently we're not all choosing to be, you know, as basic as that is to the human mind and intelligence. The example Kant gives is, do not lie. If we all lied, society would fall apart, he says, which is oddly, as many have pointed out, consequentialist of a theory. It's like our mind has to rationally deduce that and get there before experience or something, as if that's not our experience are in it. And so we must always tell the truth, if even if uh, if we choose to speak rationally. Kant is very logical captain's post-Stoic uh, pre-Spock. So you always speak the truth if, you if you're to speak at all. There is with Buddhism, don't speak unless it's pragmatically useful, very much on the other side. All these people would say you don't have to talk. It's important to mention that. You don't have to tell people things, but you do not have, you should not lie. Um, Pragmatism, again, and the other side, the consequentialism, you could say, no, be Robin Hood, lie when you got to, or when you need to. I mean, who cares about the supervillain versus the children? But Kant technically is, says we would have society fall apart if we do not adhere to not lying and categorical truth, which is still, in many ways, the psychological and philosophical backs and forths of many ethical positions, as I go into in detail far more, of course, at all, in the ethics class. So for Kant, immorality is never justified. This is comparable to saying, comparable, comparable, do we have standards and yet such facts and verbiage and words and static data, always in motion so oddly, that if we have math, why don't we calculate never lie at all for any sorts of purposes? And it is very much like, no, saying 2 plus 3 equals 6 for an alternate math would always be wrong. And I cannot imagine a world, even if everybody was happy as all living heck every time 2 plus 3 equals 6, I do not want to live in a world at all in which people use 2 plus 3 equals 6 to save all the small children and feed them ice cream. This is basically... 
If you are, and this is also trusting there's a structure, this isn't just higgledy-piggledy, everything's floating in space. Of course, assuming we live in a rational world and cosmos, immorality would never again be justified. You could not sort of lie for the children or propagandistically on the left or the right, do anything lie-wise for good, ever. And both sides could accuse everybody of everything, of course. You never lie for good, never. Needless to say, that's a little too dogmatic for many to put into practice, is a bit ideal, and we are talking German idealism. John Stuart Mill, we would then study in utilitarianism, and I will get into pragmatism in this class plenty, so we will get into Mill. And I'm going to get more into Mill for logic also. He argued for the opposite position, that the ends justify the means, which means just as much as they do, not evilly so, of course, which is the arguments here, but we don't mean evil do, yes, hooray. And morality is only instrumental for the purpose of achieving happiness overall. And here we mean good happiness for the most amount of people, which is basically what Mill argues. And there's problems either way, of course. For Kant, you stick and start with the true morals. For Mill, you aim and you evolve towards the good ends. Now, we are back and forth. In fact, what I am going to be arguing, and Hegel very much does, is we can see Kant and others and Hume go back and forth between opposite sides. We've already been setting this up here, such that we have reason, deductive, and empirical em experience from the empiricist inductively upward, as it were, and deductive downward, very much like the king deduces and rules. And then we have the upward populace experiencing various things and raising thing up into uh, raising things up for the court to consider as more experience and, and all over the place. And you very much have Mill as a very big progressive. He thinks we should be making more people in society happy. He believes in progress for women, end of slavery, and he very much thinks, well, we should break eggs to make the omelet and break some rules and change things around. Kant says if we do, we will have society topple. It's not hard to see how this is a bit right, a bit left, and it is a bit of plenty of our opposite and opposing mind states, where we have something like the objective truth that we have to stick with, and then we have something like the subjective truth, but what if we had different tribes who perform math and other rules differently? Without solving all the issues in that, in fact, continuing to talk positions about that, that is very squarely where we are setting ourselves in these positions. And we are going to be doing that right after we're doing it ethically here with Kant versus Hume, which you can see how the logical issues and the ethical issues very much line up. And they do for Kant and they do for Hegel both, and except they are different, but they are very much for both these thinkers one and the same in the ways I am describing. Something like one versus many. Uh, the Platonists would have called the problem of the one and the many. How do we have objective truth 2 plus 3 equals 5 if there are many shades of red? Good question, you know and good questions and positions here, and bad ones and whatever you like or don't like. Again, Joshu, uh, one of my favorite figures of Zen, is asked, what's the true meaning of Buddhism? And he says, is there anything else you don't like? You know, this guy, get a load of this. Kant was primarily interested in, speaking of not liking uh, so many people, with metaphysics, the laws of being itself. That's very Leibniz and already German idealism, non-contradiction, bivalence, black and white, like glasses. Just as Plato's idealism was concerned with the heavens and the moves of uh, the math up above, modern idealism, very much more Descartes and the clockwork is down here with the gears and systems of the Chinese and Islamic golden ages and rolling European golden age. Modern idealism for Germans is not so much platonic up in the sky, and these Germans know the Greeks and they know who they are. I've read and heard of them before. That they are not as concerned with anything like Aristotle's metaphysics or Platonic metaphysics. What they want is what is the increasingly the word psychology of the mind. Kant and Hegel are getting up to the 1800s and through the beginning of it, the word psychology increasingly becomes a word for what these people are doing in the sciences. But that word is actually, I believe, primarily in German and then English, again, I would have to look up who strictly says it first, but psychology, I believe, is a very German originating word that then is very much picked up across the Romance languages in the mid-late 1800s, and that's right around the time you have Freud. And we have several thinkers we're going to cover before we get to the basics of, and I will cover the very basics of Freud when we get to French stuff, and I'm going to put in with the Germans, actually, and try to pop that out beforehand because you need a little tiny bit of Freud before we get to French stuff because they love Freud that's still even plenty uh, East Coast as opposed to West Coast here, as uh, far as psychology, you know, with the Germans and my mispronunciations out here. 
We're all Germanics who have forgotten all of that. That's very much white America, World War I, World War II, hello, uh, post-Auschwitz, again, with the construction of yield, white identities, and then onward. But onward again with Kant and Hume and all of that. So Kant is interested in the limitations of the human mind. This is like Locke. How do we understand things so strictly such that 2 plus 3 equals 5? So like Leibniz, and Kant admired and studied him, Kant believes in the principle of sufficient reason, that there ought to be a rational answer for what we can understand, the principle of non-contradiction, that if A and not A are both true, one has to be wrong, or <laughs> if one or both are possibilities, one should be right, the other one should be wrong, when it can be so black and white, he strictly says, and the rational universal application of logic, because the world is very logical, like for Kant, rationalists, and the Mutazilites of Islam. Uh, so Kant thought Aristotle had nearly completed logic, he says, and then he is going to simply work out some of the kinks here. Don't kink shame. This is stuff I'm going to be covering in explicitly with Aristotle's logic and then Kant's frame of logic onward. If you want more about that, I will have that under logic very soon. So later, Kant's work would impact Schopenhauer, whose work would impact Nietzsche, Wittgenstein, and a bunch of people whose work uh, would either ignore or completely revolutionize logic, unbeknownst to Kant. Kant is actually going to lead to several thinkers that are going to love and hate him, and he you know, probably loves and hates people. They probably love and hate him as he strides past grandfather clocks with his mouth closed. And yet, he has no idea the, the interesting people he's going to spawn afterwards here. It will be most all too human, Nietzsche will say. So like Descartes and Hume, Kant was well aware of ancient Greek Pyrrhonism, Pyrrhonian skepticism, as well as the challenge that skepticism and the work of Hume posed to metaphysics and rationalism. Aristotle hated ancient Greek skeptics, black and uh, shades of gray thinkers, and Aristotle, very much like Kant, wants the black and white, black and white that we can get, and thinks that's very important, foundational. Aristotle says the skeptics are mere destroyers and no better than plants, not none to think and none good uh, when it comes to philosophy. Uh, this is very much Leibniz says these guys are just like dogs getting afraid of a stick, which is deductive truth with which they have been beaten, which is a wonderful, if you believe the rationalists and deductive truth people have beaten the skeptics, then they have been beaten with the stick of, uh, and it isn't ye old stick of Zen compassion, which you also get smacked with and don't like so much, at least temporarily. Aristotle hated these skeptic destroyer plant peoples, pod people, unthinking sort of proto-quasi-communists uh, in the sci-fi. Upon reading the work of Hume, Kant famously wrote that he was woken from his, quote, dogmatic slumbers, end quote, we've already said a couple of times. And now Kant has received his true purpose in life, which is to show why Hume is wrong, wrong, and he wrong, 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 quite categorically. Now he, uh, Kant believes he has received his mission to prove that there is objective truth beyond the mere assumptions given that all beliefs are acquired through experience. So now we have the empiricists are right, we get math through our lives. But once we get math through our lives, we can tell that math is purely math, is what Kant is saying, because it fits the glasses and the categories of the mind. That is basically what Kant says. Many like and hate that. Again, Kant's work, like that of Descartes, is concerned with finding what can be defined as certain and objective in the face of doubting everything. Specifically, Kant sought to rescue Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason, if something exists, there need to be reasons or a reason why it is that way. And if we can figure something out, we should be able to close it out. In a sense, categorically and completely. Or there should be issues like that. And he also, Kant is seeking to rescue Leibniz's principle of non-contradiction. That if I say 2 plus 3 equals 5 and you say it is anything other than 5, your answer is contradicting the categorical truth and you are wrongity wrong. Not just wrongity wrong, but wrong, period, and black and white. Yes, you can see how all this fits together very much. And you can also see how you have gnawing at the edges, and that's very much the back and forths of our minds in these different positions. And I am encouraging you to place these in different places and look at and feel out and think out and word out these various things, which is what we do when we teach this uh, as philosophy and as history. 
Kant says that metaphysics could go now in his age beyond dogmatism and skepticism, and he knows of that of the Greeks, and so does Hegel. Dogmatism and skepticism are very important to me. When I learned about that in Hegel and other things, I thought, wow, that's actually very important, and that has been an inspiring position for me. There is very much, Hegel is going to argue, and he gets it from Kant, although he's going to be very different with it. Hegel says there's an endless battle, very much that he hopes resolves in Lutheranism and white science. Hooray, we're all done with that now, we know, 100 years ago. Effectively, if culture is going to stop and settle, then we will skeptically, skeptically come to more and more dogmatism for Hegel. But he basically says the world is objective versus subjective truth in art, science, religion, fight, 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 fight. And you can see that in the positions of ancient Greek and modern European philosophy. I do like to say you see plenty of it in India, which Hegel gives a zero, and China, which he gives a pass, as in he doesn't know Chinese philosophy pretty much exists. Uh, but in spite of that, we actually have more Chinese philosophy in our lives today, I would say, than Indian philosophy in universities. In spite of the fact that Germans are waking to Indian philosophy, that's unfortunately later a bit of the crossover of the swastika and all of that, a little yeesh. Um, but that doesn't come from Hegel specifically. He knows some Indian stuff. He gives a zero with the Buddha. They don't do anything really except nothingness. Wow. And then he basically says, uh, Chinese philosophy, yeah, he hasn't really heard of, doesn't say anything. Hegel very much passes over India and Islam each with about a page or so in the ancient and medieval worlds because he doesn't think they really do anything other than hold on to some stage of something. All development for Hegel is Greek and then German, which we will get to, but we're not there yet. Until then, Hegel, very much like Kant, says there's dogmatism, yay objective truth, and skepticism, yay subjective truth. Well, we've already had those positions. Now, what is Kant saying? Before Hegel, Kant is saying, I am being a dogmatic rationalist. I'm trying to bargain with you uh, empiricist-minded uh, folks from Britain. I'm trying to say, yes, I agree. We would not know except through experience. Descartes kind of didn't shut that down entirely with all of that, I think, therefore I am. But at the same time, I don't want to say 2 plus 3 equals 5 is always an assumption we keep getting right. I want to say, no, that feels like the structure itself, and so I'm going to say the glasses of the mind have a certain shape. Maybe experience in the world is a bunch of piles, but the glasses of the mind are shaped such that 2 plus 3 is always 5. Once we get it from experience, that's how our minds are shaped. We're not an entirely blank slate, tabula rasa. We are somewhat grooved and fitted to have something like solid object. That is solid versus not. And 2 plus 3 equals 5, and Kant believes those things like substance, not substance, like absence, which I deal with all the time. It's like substance, absence. And then something like 1, 2, which notice presence, 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 and then we have three presences. Ah, ah, ah. Something like that is the structure of the mind. That is very powerful. That is very true. And it is very true that Chinese, ancient, and modern have adverbs, you know? So, seems that we have shape of the mind, right? I would also tell you post-Piaget, we still are not entirely Kantian or not right now in philosophy or psychology, nor psychology, what have you is, practice, you know, a bit of praxis, practice, what have you is, and this and the other sides of the world. But with all of that, we still are very much here, which is why these ideas are really cool. We, it's not that it was useless to say, it's that in saying these things, we actually are still amidst all of this right now. No matter how fancy I would say you get, I still can see how thought is entangled in psychology and philosophy, not reading everybody's work, of course I can't, definitely we are amidst all of this neo-Kantian, Hume, Kant, Hegel stuff still, which means we're still very much in British and German thought, and yeah, we very much would still be very much in German, French, uh, French British, and German thought a lot as a culture. And as the world, plenty, because these are the latest stuff that's plenty been printed and spread around and happened, which is describing the human condition as best as we can, and we know it through history and now. So in his early work, uh, so Kant says, before leaving that point, that metaphys metaphysics, can go, <laughs> metaphysics can go beyond both dogmatism and skepticism to become critical. Like Descartes questioning all truth to distinguish what is objectively true beyond all appearances. In his early work, Kant wrote about philosophy and the natural sciences, reconciling the work of Newton with philosophy and theology. Like Descartes, Kant argued that regularity of the cosmos shows that it is intelligently designed and operates in a rational manner. That, again, is square in philosophy, you know, and Hegel does thinks it's a process, much like Whitehead, but both Hegel and Whitehead are affirmedly Christian. Strangely, in his old age, Kant hypothesized, I do love this, that the use of domestic electricity caused strange cloud formations 
and epidemics of disease in cats, a theory which might have survived if Cot had lived in the days of ye old internet. Again, it was the 90s. As with, as, is that Mr. Magoo? It's a yes. It was, that was before the 90s, um, and yet the 90s still knew of all of that, had not closed its eyes to that just yet. Awoken by the skepticism of Hume, Kant spent a 10-year decade of silence. This is like Locke. From 1770, except it took him 20 years, to 1780, working on the first of his three critiques, the Critique of Pure Reason. The Originally, Kant thought the work would take three months. Kant, uh, the first critique, focuses on objective rational inquiry, questions you can ask, uh, exclusively separate from the influence of experience, he thinks. Now, it is not very Wittgensteinian at all to say there is anything like math apart from social practice, as icky and sticky as that all becomes, and we'll have time to wrestle with that after and through Hegel. Let's not do that all right now. Because that's the never-ending, of course, uh, well, as, as the Zen guy says, who is this student here playing with this mud ball here? So the first critique is on what Kant believes. We can separate out from all the ethics and art and beauty and truth and feeling nice and loving about things, which is also art and love and ethics are very, very good, noble things that we should all consider, and he does in his second and third critique, ethics and art. Love and beauty, very high up there. But you'll notice love and ethics and beauty and art are actually very subjective, feely things. What Kant is doing is he is very much saying, I'm going to separate the philosophy and the math and the hard questions, he believes the hardware, apart from something like the emotional software. I am going to separate out here the questions we can exclusively answer black and white from the other stuff. Now that dance still exists today. It very much does, and in fact, I do think, as I was taught, Wittgenstein's later work really points the best way forward in a lot of ways, and I will demonstrate again. That will come as it does. I mentioned bits and pieces. I will spend much more time explaining what I mean by that when we get there, but let's just say that this is Kant trying to explain why 2 plus 3 equals 5 in the world we continue to experience in so many different ways. So the second two critiques, the critique of practical reason and the critique of pure judgment, focus on the use of reason in practical matters. The critique of practical reason deals with freedom and morality, that's ethics, and the and love and feelings towards other people. And the critique of pure judgment deals with aesthetics, the study of beauty and art and what we find pleasing. All of which, again, is nice and the best parts, but the one, two, three of the best parts. We focus on the first critique here as we have been on epistemology. In fact, I have to say, I do know plenty about the first and the second because I know a lot about the uh, the object. Well, and Kant isn't even my guy, as particularly. I know about the first, which we cover much here. I know about the second and ethics and ethics. The third is actually, Kant's aesthetics is important for a lot of people. He uses the term sublime uh, in that word a lot, uh, in the work a lot, which is famous, of course, uh, around here in California for the band. But... I actually don't know much about Kant's aesthetics. It's not my area. Um, and aesthetics in philosophy is actually not my favorite part, although I like beauty and art just fine. I like the conceptual in it plenty. Um, but we'll get all to that in modern art and other things I find conceptual and interesting that screw with things. But we're not going to do that right here. Again, what we're going to do is focus on the first, the first critique, and focus on epistemology, objective and subjective truth, and what do we know, which is also ontology, what exists. Much as Descartes sought to incorporate while overcoming Peronian skepticism, how do we get over the gray areas and get the black and white out of that and experience and above it? Kant, Kant sought to incorporate while overcoming Hume's empiricism with rationalism. Kant argued that Hume was right about the world of experience, which we can only know subjectively and Im imperfectly, Im -im -im -im, but not about the logical operation of reason, which we can know objectively and certainly. So Locke says the faculty of understanding is like the human eye. Kant, again, is often said to uh, be, uh, Kant is often illustrated with eyeglasses. We may not be able to know what the world looks like without our glasses and concepts, but we can examine how our understanding and mind is shaped in order to understand how the world and our reality must be shaped in our experience, is what Kant is arguing. And notice, this is for the ancient Greeks, something like ideal, uh, idealism, how the world and cosmos is shaped by the gods' as mentalities. This is increasingly in an intermental thing and psychology for these more modern 1700s and 1800s Germans, German idealism. 
So Kant argued that we can critically examine our faculty of understanding with reason to understand how our ideas must take shape, to understand both the basis of understanding and the motions of reason. This would put metaphysics, such as the principle of non-contradiction, quote, on the secure path of science, end quote. Is it? Do you know of metaphysics, metaphysics as a science? Is formal logic a science that the other sciences bow to today? Is it? Science in German is Wissenschaft, or knowledge base. And again, as a white American, I can't pronounce my Germanics. So unlike Berkeley, Barclay, again, Kant believes that there is a thing in itself beyond appearances, the Ding on Sieg in the German, using the Latin term nomina for the things themselves and phenomena for our perceptions of them. I do like the Mel Brooks history of the world joke where one of the, where there's white people leaving, you know, there's white Roman Senator people in the, the actors and many actors speak all British and other stuff. And one of the actors of course is saying at tempo seek Gloria. I don't speak the Latin. And the other guy, the other Senator is like, I didn't know Gloria was sick. You know, it's say Gloria. Yes, I don't speak as a Deutsch Latin here's nor theirs uh, nor anywheres. You know, it's against the whole fox in the box routine. And again, that is very Kant, you know, and his untrained cats. Kant says we can never know the thing itself. Hegel's going to say, ah, he shouldn't even have it here. Technically, Kant doesn't. And he gets accused of it by Hegel. And that's what people say a lot um, who study this stuff. So we can't know the thing in itself. Let's just leave that alone because Hegel makes too much of it possibly. But we can know the way that we form ideas about appearances. So we see our minds form-ish stuff and we have thus the glasses we look through. I am a fan of looking at that kind of, of, that kind of metaphor. We are going to study then phenomenology. Hegel, Merleau-Ponty, and others are going to try to create a science of appearances they call phenomenology which isn't really a reigning science, you know, is very much psychology. And then I don't, you know, well, I'm sure there's phenomenologists plenty out there who are something like, of course, psychologists and uh, something in the realm of being therapy and delving into the mind. Kant uses another pair of Latin terms to distinguish between the rational and empirical truth, to separate the objective from the subjective. That which is known before and apart from all experience, Kant labels a priori. You will also hear it pronounced by Americans a, uh, a, priori, a, a priori or a priori. And that which is known after and through all experience, Kant labeled a posteriori or a posteriori, again, depending on how you pronounce your brands of pasta. The central question of the critique of pure reason is how are synthetic a priori judgments possible, which is a fancy question. Again, my great grandmother, who has sadly passed, would be like, well, isn't that fancy, you know, who lived through the Great Depression? Well, when we analyze a thing, we break it into its component parts, like you probably had to do during the Great Depression plenty. When we synthesize a thing, again, as one would have to, we put many parts together to form a greater whole. Analysis, break it into parts. Synthesis, put it together. Usually when people say, I'm going to analyze something, they mean they're going to analyze it and then synthesize it into conclusions. And they're not just analyzing. In fact, this is very much like deduction and induction. It's hard to think of one entirely without the other. And that's actually some Wittgensteinian, Kantian kinds of neo-Kantian, post-neo-Kantian problems and all of that. Kant wants to bring together, to synthesize, to gather together what can be known before and apart from experience about the human mind. So he wants to condense into this text what we can know categorically and certainly. So first, we're going to analyze down to the bone here, down to the marrow for the Zen. We're going to cut down to the bone of, of logic and reason. And then we're going to bring that and synthesize our analysis, our cutting apart together. And then we're going to have the synthetic a priori. And what he fancily, uh, fancily means, oh so fancy, and his fancy wording is we are going to bring together in this work the ways the mind is cuts things apart and is categorical at most base is what synthetic a priori means such that your mind already has two plus three equals five in it from the time that you are a baby. And as you are filling in your blank slate, you can't help but have the slots that you have that fill in the ways that they do. He believes that is why we say have knock, knock, knock. We're set up as babies to knock into solid objects and think they're solid solid and then there's emptiness between stuff and he also thinks that's how we're set up to have two plus three equals five effectively because he very quickly comes to substances and math and quantities are things and that's how our mind shapes things so something like knock knock this is the space isn't which i use in ancient modern philosophy a lot 
and how our minds are bang. Oh, wow. Okay. The space around the table isn't the table is, and yet that's not so simple. We talk about it. It isn't. And yet bang, our minds shape it that way. I use that a lot. And it's so simple. We use it all the time that it's easy to look past or misspeak about. That Khan thinks my mind says table exists, space around it doesn't, is empty, I can walk through the space, can't walk through the table. That is basic to my mind, and that 2 plus 3 equals 5 effectively, and the base of that is basic to the mind, something like Chomsky's X-bar, Y-bar theory. So you would have to have adverbs eventually if you were civilized enough or had enough experience, because that's just there in the mind of, let's hope, the savage and ourselves equally here. Which is not Kant's position, um, actually. So... He's a bit more categorical in dividing up the human race quite uh, infamously, of course. So how do we break, how do we pull all together the basic ways we carve the mind apart with black and white reasoning and mathematical logic like reasoning uh, that isn't shades of gray, but is black and white. So if we figure out elementary linear arithmetic in the dark, uh, we may never be able to predict how many coconuts we will gather next Tuesday, but we can be certain that if we gather two coconuts and then three, we will have gathered five coconuts. We can then reason that if we gather six more, we will have 11, synthesizing additional mathematical truths via reason, apart from the experience of gathering any coconuts. Thus, while Hume is right that whatever we think we may gather on a Tuesday is merely an assumption, Kant argues that if we are being objective, we cannot reason two and three uh, together any other way than the sum of five, giving us a synthesized assumption that is objective and certain, what Descartes sought all along. As mentioned with Descartes, this strangely makes the ideas of logic and mathematics certainties, while the existence of coconuts or Paris, France are merely assumptions continuously. Essentially, not in their quantity of individuality, but that they still exist and aren't smoking craters effectively. So Kant sought to rescue logic, including the principle of non-contradiction, from Hume's char charge that all truth is assumption, and he hoped to do this by deducing the principles of logic without relying on assumptions based on experience. This would reveal that logic was truly transcendental, necessary and universal to all experience, the frame through which we must grasp any idea or understanding. While the word transcendent means exclusively removed or from and supreme, transcendent above, like a sage who has transcended the world of desires and sits atop a mountain removed. Transcendental means consistently throughout and universal. Like the American transcendentalist, God is throughout pantheistically like Spinoza the whole, and we can feel God in our uh, pantheistically. So not, actually, it's a tricky word because transcendent means above and exclusive. Transcendental actually means something like not transcendent apart, but transcendent above, within, and through very much. So it's tricky because it is sort of higher, but higher throughout. So wherever one, uh, wherever one is in the ocean, one would be wet as there is water throughout it. So it is kind of like wetness is kind of like an overall quality over, but throughout and in. The American transcendentalists, such as Emerson and Thoreau, argued that reality is an undivided whole beneath divisions imposed by the mind, a view they found in ancient Indian and Greek thought, and thus the oneness of things is not above and beyond, not transcendent, but within and throughout, transcendental, putting them in the pantheist company of Spinoza. Unlike the transcendentalists, Kant argued that the objective and subjective should be exclusively divided to prevent misunderstanding and maintain coherence, much as Locke had attempted to divide objective primary qualities from subjective subje uh, secondary qualities. Square quantity 2 plus 2 equals 4 from red, shades of red, gray area versus black and white. Central to this, for Kant, was the definition and operation of the faculties of understanding and reason. These are very important for Hegel. This is why, as a boy, he's cheering on the French Revolution on different sides of the left and the right. Now, you may notice in politics, we're not going to go off on politics right now. We will save that a bit for Hegel, just as we spared a bit of ethics for Kant, but not much. Understanding and reason for Kant is very much something like the stick it where it is and reason move it around forces. Now, Hegel reading Kant as a boy says, hey, wait a minute, there's keep it where it is, move it all around. That looks like the right and the left wings of the French assembly as they broke into the right and the left wings of the French revolution, the more let's keep it the way it is revolutionary side, but change it somewhat, and the let's radically change it all around in the name of science and progress side with Robespierre most infamously on the far, far left. 
And that is what broke Kant's routine, walking past regular Newtonian-ish grandfather clocks, but most German rather than British, unless they were imported. And I don't see why that would be. So, again, it would probably come more so from Switzerland. So, uh, and yet none of this is quite neutral, is it? No, it crosses all of our boundaries. So, it's like the Von Trapps, but backwards. Hegel took up Kant's distinction between the faculties of understanding and reason. But influenced by a fellow philosopher and friend Schelling, Hegel argued that understanding and reason must be synthesized and united progressively, not exclusively divided. Kant would have considered this the ultimate confusion, arguing in his first critique that the mixing of understanding and reason, the parts of the mind that separate things and the mo moves, is a major source of philosophical error, as each has properly exclusive jobs to do. For Hegel, Kant's exclusive division between understanding and reason, as well as the division between the thing itself and our experience of it, which sets him up to fail for Hegel very much, whether or not he's talking as we talk, if you get what I mean. Setting up the model, but not, but saying, but that's not what it is, as what it is certainly not. That's, these are uh, become, for Hegel, failures of Kant's inability to synthesize the whole with reason above and beyond the divisions of understanding. While Kant thought that reason should ultimately serve understanding and then stay put with it, maintaining exclusive distinctions. Now 2 plus 3 just equals 5, we have our rights, we're done. Hegel thought that reason should transcend while extending understanding, although then we're in the final form of rights and laws and Lutheranism. Uniting all in the transcendental one and the mind of God, which he most uh, impiously says is coming down on earth through history, but softly says it. And Hegel sounds much like more of the American transcendentalists, that Newton is actually the mind of God on earth, and we're slowly getting ideas of God through Newton and the succession of folks like that. For Kant, experience requires two separate elements, sensation and understanding. Sensation is the raw content, and understanding is the conceptual form that makes sensation coherent. Consider Barclay's example of an apple. As we look at an apple, our experience is a union of the undefined sensation and the exclusive categories with which we understand the sensation, such as red, solid, apple, and fruit, the categories, concepts. Without both, there is no coherent experience of the apple. Kant argues that we can become confused and believe that the category of apple and red exist in the world itself as present in the thing itself, but if we are being rational and exclusive, if we're carving the mind apart from the world, we can see that we in the mind have categories of understanding that are not given in the world. We draw lines around what an apple and a pear is that are not simply and completely there, but as conceptions of the mind, as lines we draw around the world such that apples and pears exist. As Hume argued about cause and effect, you'll notice he says the same. We are drawing lines around what looks like cause actually is my mind imposing a conception of cause. Kant follows Hume here, but more radically, in order to be anti-Hume. He picks up Hume's artillery, he turns it back around at Hume, and says, but math would stay still in spite of that, which is quite the assault. Thus, the thing in itself cannot be known, but the categories of understanding, when exclusive, non-contradictory, and coherent, can be known with pure clarity. Unlike Locke's primary qualities, for Kant, the objective is mental, not physical, because, of course, for Locke, squareness is still out in the world. For Kant... It is very clear here, and this is a big problem with Kantianism and Neo-Kantianism. For Kant, there is objective truth, but it is not really in the world and the thing itself. It is in our minds, which seems superior and seems a good position and unassailable. The problem here, and this goes all the way out to later Wittgenstein, is what are we going to do, though, with pure categories of mind you know, that are static right there? And is that all of what we understand? I don't think so. But for Kant, what he thinks is our understanding takes these sensations and experiences and synthesizes all the broken up stuff into categories, while also exclusively dividing the categories from each other. So after we experience several objects, some of which are red and some of which are apples, we form conceptions of redness and apples. As the self experiences the world through its understanding, it finds itself with pre-existing fundamental categories. So we start to sift out, there are these fundamental uh, drawers in our mind, which Kant calls foundations which also translates as principles in the German. Uh, Grundsatzen sein. It's again my Grundsatz sein. And again, thank you for, mis, uh, for mishearing my mispronunciations. Hegel was critical of Kant for pulling these categories out of nowhere. I insist it's your categorical error, not mine, without describing their development uh, or the development of our amicable relationship here. 
with my audience, but Khan believed that the origin of the foundational categories is beyond human comprehension. That's another thing that Hegel is going to say. Khan says, oh, there's categories. I can't explain why we suddenly have what we are. And the major problem with that you could already see is, but what if I want to show you how you're conditioned to believe this is a finger snap, two plus three equals five, and there are turtles. Khan's like, oh, there's just objective truth. I don't know. It just is. The mind's just shaped the way I say it is. That's not going to be good enough for modern psychology. Child psychology, Piaget after Hegel and Hume, is it? But why this is Kant explaining Hume? Because he says this is what Hume is seeing. One of the categories of our mind is causation. Our minds are set up to have A causing B as babies. So when Hume says, hey, look, that all piles up in us, he's right. But he's right because he's sitting there watching one of the categories that's already there, like substance and cause, get filled in. And these are the two that we're going to examine. Those are two most solid ones, and we're not going to get into all of Kant's 12 and etc. What we're going to do just here is substance, he thinks, is a drawer in you. Wittgenstein's going to argue against drawers in you. With this in mind, we're a blank slate, but you have drawers in the blank slate. Some of that substance, some of that's cause. That's the baby out in the world. That explains Hume for Kant. That is the best way of saying it. <coughs> Excuse me. For Kant, the mind is an empty uh, cabinet, but it then fills in with causation and substance, and then we understand the world regularly. And in fact, we can say we understand the world largely the way the ancient Chinese did, because the brain may not change those ways. That is a very strong position to be neo-Kantian with. Unfortunately, I do like later Germanics and then Wittgenstein and all messing all of this up, and we'll get to that. Now, Aristotle presented his categories. I'm not going to get into detail on that. I will with Lewis Carroll and other things. Locke uh, talks of mental faculties. Kant turned from empiricism and Locke to ideal categories to reflect how we get all this into ideal categories of mind. And we could say today, we have in our zeitgeist, post, we could say philosophical kind of understandings, that if I snap my fingers, if I say 2 plus 3 equals 5, that that is of the mind and of the world altogether. That is very much what we could call psychology and sort of the psychological zeitgeist. We all understand mind is world, world, world is mind plenty. But what is the firm structure of this? What are the categories Aristotle, Kant onward continues to be a problem? Um, and we have roughly talked out, again, what I have in more detail, and I've been uh, somewhat imposing again, uh, more so my own reflections and interweavings here, rather than the firm form of the notes, most categorically. But essentially, um, what Kant is, Mouse just temporarily went out, will come back, I am sure. In Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, um, he basically says that we can see the 12 categories reflected in the four forms of pure judgment. And he separates out these 12 in ways, um, and he says that this can be abstracted and freed from all content. Um, he provides no explanation other than the systematic presentation of the four and how they can have form or be interrelated. And he really does try to present the static mind crystal without any explanation of child development or historical development. And... Hegel is very much historical development, and I have to say I really like Wittgenstein because in many ways Wittgenstein is child development and Piaget in order to speak modern psychology, zeitgeist speak. Piaget would be a bit iffy with Kant's categories. Where do they come from? Now, he wouldn't be completely opposed because it seems like Piaget is saying the child is ready to roll out in stages, but Hegel would say here, but what are the stages and how do they form? And you don't have a pure crystal with Kant and categories out of nowhere. Aristotle has 10, Kant has 12, but where do these categories come from is a big beef with Hegel. And he, that's how he's going to have history, and he believes that we have to develop from the Greeks to the Germans with progress, which is kind of uh, ethnocentric and very Eurocentric, most specifically. For Kant, though, you can see how reason organizes understanding and understanding organizes sensation, and he lays out a very nice system in which judgment performs these roles of carving up these things like a knife, a la Occam's razor a bit, and that's a bit Brit, and he, like Hume. So reason infers the similarities and differences of understanding forming ideas, ideas such as freedom and beauty, central examples used by Kant fleshed out in the second and third critiques, are not directly experienced in the world, but are formed through inferences drawn from understanding. In a certain sense, of course, beauty is thus, we do know, how we see the world as beautiful as the observer, is in the eye of the beholder, but inseparably, because we sort of don't learn 
Beauty from experience, we experience it and then it is upon us, is a very compelling argument decently against Hume pro Kant here. But again, that's actually a very instinctive argument, not a very mathematical one, to be honest. For Kant, it is crucial to keep reason separate from understanding. Reason is transcendent. It needs to be separate because otherwise you're going to get your reasonings mixed up with your understandings and everything's going to be in motion and not static. Well, for Hegel, while he does want all this to separate out, he does essentially end up with reasoning he wants to be static, whereas Hegel wants things to settle out after all the revolutions into a stable society, but he definitely does not think that Kant does enough justice to the motions and evolution of reason. And that's all before Darwin. Hegel is talking before Darwin, but then with Darwin, we certainly can't be entirely Kantian. And one could say after Hegel and Darwin, and Nietzsche and others, but very much after Darwin, Kantian thinkers would have to be very neo-Kantian. It is very difficult to say there's 12, they are just what they are, but there's a lot of folks. They say a lot of things. Um, but neo-Kantians today after Darwin would have trouble with just having the static 12 out of nowhere rather than post-Piaget child behavior and development of these then emergent, perhaps latent, categories and behaviors in the mind as the glasses and the understanding and frame of reason and the world. Again, if reason screws up the categorical understandings, that screws it up. So I'll get into Hegel and again, more of why this is not Kant with Hegel in more detail in the next talk. We are upon the hour as per use, uh, as per use and usual, depending on convention. So both believe, Hegel and Kant, that the reason works through dialectic by weighing both sides of a potential judgment and then extending the understanding, arriving at greater understanding than before. And you can see very much the Newtonian clockwork Kant should be credited for as figuring out a lot of the clockwork Hegel is going to pick up and dance around with through history and show how this is the clockwork in history. Look at this, swing back, pe pendulum, 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 right, left, right, fight, fight, fight. And then all of that ended with German Lutheranism, as we know, last week. So should reason never result in contradiction, or should it contradict itself and then overcome the contradiction? That's a great frame for postmodernism onward, isn't it? Yes, it is still. It depends on whether one accepts or opposes the principle of non-contradiction as well as the powers that be, and you're reacting culturally or counterculturally against them. Very much whether you like or lump that, right? So for Kant, we just have a minute or two here. For Kant, understanding has uh, rules things, uh, but reason rules ideas. And this is how the whole system works. So Kant argues we are free, but we are in a sense free to find the singular necessary and objective truth or to be mistaken and confused about the right answer. I mentioned Bill Hicks with Barclay. Bill Hicks famously also said, um, mocking American gladiators on television, and then says, hey, have some of this, idiot. And he says, you are free to do as we tell you, as the conspiratorial left and right would both say. Yes, people who care get somewhat delusional. I don't know how that keeps happening in all different directions of the Tea Party. So... You are free to do as we tell you. That's very much, unfortunately, Nietzsche's criticism of Kant. Uh, Nazis, of course, unfortunately, uh, post uh, all, uh, Arbeit mach frei, famously over Auschwitz, which is work is freedom. And, of course, they were not actually advertising the places of death camp. They were actually like, oh, working is then conforming, and conforming then gets us all together, and all together then we are free to be the people we should be, and they're just assuming they're the right society in that sign. And that's quite a signpost of the times, you know, and then onward. So as with all of that, you know, without mentioning plenty that goes unmentioned, um, that still exists in spite of that, although we'll get to a French existence and what we don't pay attention to doesn't truly exist plenty, but still does, oddly and specifically. That uh, George Orwell very much says this is doublespeak a bit. Um, the, in the tyrannical Big Brother uh, of 1984, War is Peace. Kant uses the metaphor of an island and a stormy sea to say the rational mind in the flux of the sensual world is objective and rational in the sea of the uncertain. Now, Schopenhauer is a Kantian, and we're going to get to him soon, after Hegel. He hated both of them. He likes Kant more than Hegel, but in a certain sense, wow. He used a similar metaphor of a ship on a stormy sea. More skeptical than Kant as a boat is not fastened down, but drifts with the current of the passions. While the understanding is passive and can only judge sensations as they happen, reason is free to speculate as to what could or should happen. Hume famously argued one cannot derive an ought from an is in his ethics, that we cannot know what should happen merely based on what is happening. 
Kant meets Hume halfway. Ought and is are two separate things, as Hume argued, but for Kant, reason can derive what objectively ought to be when it can. Kant very much, and Russell very much like this, there are things we can't know, like favorite flavor of ice cream for all time, but there are things like 2 plus 3 equals 5 we can know, and reason needs to separate those and deductively slam truth shut where it can. Which means where we can be black and white, we need to separate off the black and white as black and white, and then slam that shut black or white. Constant central example of do not lie is a very good example of this. We need to close that out and realize never lie. Perfect. Okay, flawless victory, the end. Except then existence is a problem, but that's messy flux of stuff. Also, beyond the mind, in the whole experience. The conclusion is seen by reason to be universal, necessary, and objective. So reason cannot tell us whether or not we will lie next Tuesday, but it could objectively say it's all, it would always be wrong. Can't give us prophecy, but can tell us what categorical morality should be for Kant. Nietzsche thus famously said, and I do love this metaphor, that Kant was like a fox who admirably broke out of his cage only to lose his way and wander back into it. Nietzsche disregards all claims to objective truth as mere human interpretations, and so he admires, he admires Kant for arguing that reason is free to do as it likes, but finds him foolish for arguing that reason must conform to the rational objective understanding or be wrong. I do believe that it is Schopenhauer. I think it's possibly Nietzsche, but I have to look in the notes. I think it's Schopenhauer who also says Kant is like a man who, and I do, especially with Wittgenstein, love this, and I think it's Schopenhauer, possibly Nietzsche. I think it's Schopenhauer, though, and I should put it here as well in my notes, that Kant is like a man who woos a woman all night long at a mass ball, only to his horror at midnight when all the masks are removed, realizes it has been the whole time his wife. Which, of course, with great humor and passion, we understand a little too much that Kant is wooing truth in the real world, and the whole night he thinks he has something ideal and something romantic, only to realize it's the woman he's been married to the entire time. It's just truth in the real world, and that's no fun much at all. Um, that, again, is hilariously the ideal not being so ideal and thus being a real kick in the pants. So that is, of course, uh, Schopenhauer and then Nietzsche as more cynical Germans after Kant, who himself is quite puritanical and, cer and cynically <laughs> about uncertain about much in his life and keeping his mouth open outside, Kant and uh, Schopenhauer and Nietzsche are going to mock Kant's need for categorical caged truth as a, as a brilliant fox in the world and the wild out here. So realists like the Scottish realists who had an impact on analytic philosophy thought that Kant had gone too far in agreeing with the skepticism of Hume. That no, math is real in the real world, it just is, right as rain. Similar to Johnson, Samuel Johnson kicking the rock to refute Barclay, realists argue that it is ridiculous to speak of causation and substance as categories of the mind. In fact, it's very neo-Kantian to say, because just exists objectively in the world, it's not just a crystal in the mind or my glasses. And that is a bit neo-realist in a sense, as they are clear and objectively present in the world just right in his reign. So that actually makes Kant look like he's Looney Tunes for putting objectivity outside the world in the mind. The question is, when is it worthwhile to question our conceptions of causes and substances, and thus the substances all too human of institutions, which we are going to get to with Hume right and left and back again and onward. All right, much happiness. I am going to start bringing these into chapters, make them easier to follow and uh, study. So much happiness. Again, uh, if you are in the class, consider you know some of the subjects and topics and your ideas for the first and second paper. Please contact me with any ideas you may or may not have about the material if you are in the classes and uh, hoping to discuss ideas for a better paper and or grade. Much happiness to everyone. And again, as usual, whether or not we're going to be categorical about saying such things, I will see you, certainly and most tautologically, if I will and do ever see you.